Good evening, everybody. This is Robin with another edition of Horror Pop After Midnight. And my guest tonight is, she's a model, a writer, a filmmaker, Emma Dark. How's it going, Emma? Hi, Robin. Yeah, really good, thanks. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I just watched your uh, sci-fi horror short, Seize the Night. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, I love the cinematography. Um, it was well shot, well done. I love the certain shots and angles you did on the scenes with the cinematography. And I love how it was filmed in black and white with a little color into it. Yeah, I mean, it is actually, that's got quite heavy grade on it. So um, it is quite muted, but there are little bits of color. So, you know, that scene in the garage, if you look, you will see little bits of color. But I mean, well, I see them because I know it's there. So it's not entirely black and white, but it's probably about 90% black and white. Yeah, that's why. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, the cinematography, I had two people doing the cinematography on the film. One was a chap called Donato Cinicolo, and he did probably the majority of the cinematography. So all of the kind of dialogue scenes, the more sort of um, uh, sort of static work. And then I got in um, another chap called AJ Singh, who specialises in uh, kind of like you know fight cinematography, the action stuff, and he um, shot the action scenes. So it's quite important to get the angles right, etc. and yeah, it's, it's quite difficult um, to do that if you don't have that experience with action cinematography. So, yeah, I had two people doing it. Yeah, and um, I love the fight cinematography, too, the, choreogra- the choreography. Um, that mm. was well done, too. The fight scenes were just pretty solid. Yeah, well, those were choreographed by Roy Scannell, who, unfortunately, he's now passed away. But for many um, years, many decades, he spent... Um, time in Hollywood as a stuntman and he did a bunch of stuff including Alien so he doubled for Sigourney Weaver for some of her scenes um, which is quite amazing when you know that they're they're actually quite different heights and builds and stuff but it still worked and um, if you remember in Alien the aliens ejected out of the shuttle at the end of the film, that's Roy Um, he did some of the uh, dance and fight choreography in A Clockwork Orange, uh, Tarzan, tons of stuff, James Bond, all kinds of things, really. So it was super great to have him on board. He was absolutely amazing. Yeah, I, I, and plus in the film, I loved it because it had an underworld uh, blade mm. feel to it, which was kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. I know um, there's the obvious kind of underworld associations with you know me, me being a female character in it and um, obviously Celine being a female, but it probably was for me more blade influenced. I think yeah, it, I definitely see I definitely see both things. Yeah, and I love the weapons on that. Who um who came up with those um brilliant uh weapons? I love the weapons whoever made those. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah, that was that was uh, me. So the weapons they were just BB guns. Um and then I just like resprayed them basically so they look more realistic. And I had two because, you know, invariably something breaks. And it did. Um, in the fight scene, I dropped the gun and, like, the whole thing shattered to pieces. So, like, I just had another one to the side and we could carry on filming, no problem. But, yeah. Yeah, and the, there's, like, a flash grenade as well. And that's a real flash grenade. I just resprayed that and put kind of white dots in um, where, the, where the kind of, I don't know, the, whatever they fill it with to, to kind of do the flash stuff, where that would go. And then the um, special effects artist, Davey Simmons, tracked that and put sort of glows coming out of those. So that was pretty cool. Oh, I thought it was cool. The flash grenades are pretty cool. I would love to have one of those for myself. <laughs> yeah, well, you can. You can, buy, you can buy them online. Obviously, just deactivated ones and stuff. Yeah, oh. they're great. How'd you come up with the story of Seize the Night? Um, that was kind of something I just kind of jumped into because I do like those kind of films like Blade etc like like we've discussed um, and also Jake West's Razor Blade Smile which is kind of in a similar theme obviously um, lower budget and stuff but that kind of the whole aesthetic and stuff with all the PVC and leather and having you know kind of a vampire assassin and all that kind of stuff so I'm a fan of those kind of films um, 
and that's the kind of direction I wanted to go into. And I hadn't really made uh, anything in the way of narrative um, kind of filmmaking before. Certainly not genre kind of uh, sci-fi or horror. And I just, just went gung-ho on it, basically, and just went in at the deep end. But I did have uh, a writer on board as well, a screenwriter called Rick Humphreys, who's really great um, and a really nice person as well. And he, since then, he's written a whole bunch of stuff, like millions of screenplays and novels and all mm -hmm. kinds of things. And um, it was it was really good to have him there to bring that knowledge of how to structure the dialogue, etc. So, yeah. Yeah, um, on the ending of it, you left it as a cliffhanger, too. It made me want to see more of it. So do you think there's going to be, like, a sequel short film, or do you think, will it, will it ever be a feature film? Well, at the time, I, I really wanted to make it, like, a web series. So um, the idea would be if I could ever get the budget to continue making these and just make, you know, a block of six or something like that. But as it cost about five, five and a half thousand to make it, it's pretty difficult to raise that for each episode. So in the end, yeah, it was left on a cliffhanger, which is what I wanted to do. And I do want to come back to that. And I do want to make a sequel. I always said I would. And then so much time passed, I said, oh, I probably won't be doing it now. But I would like to loop back around to that. But I think I do really need to make something else first. And then I'll loop back around to that, I think. Yeah, let's talk about British horror. Um, do you um, think it has evolved over the years even more and getting more popular? And also, do you think there's more and more uh, British indie horror filmmakers uh, making more uh, horror films over and uh, across the pond? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there there is str still a like, very strong independent British filmmaking scene when it comes to horror um i know tons of people that have been at it for years there's new people picking up things every day the only thing i would say is we don't obviously have um like we had hammer films etc i know um hammer's just come back again uh it's there's a new new hammer now which is british based and also laurie brewster's just uh, resurrected amicus films and he's hoping to kind of push that forward so they're, they're kind of production studios um but yeah in terms of indie horror there's still plenty of things coming out but i also kind of feel that it's more and more difficult for people to get distribution and even get their money back you know that they've invested into making something so i don't know but i think that's probably the same same everywhere at the minute just to do with the current climate I think so too, and I have a feeling uh, indie British horror will probably just get as popular as it's how it is over here in the states too. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I've seen like um, some news articles going up recently. There's a horror film festival called Horror on Sea, which is sort of uh, it's on the coast, sort of nearish to London, I suppose. And um, they've been getting quite a lot of uh, top news articles about that, so which have, which have come out of the blue. So obviously people are interested. There is a market there for it, and news sites are starting to report on it. So that's definitely positive. I think so too. Um, have you shot? Um, have you showed any of your uh, films over here in the states at any of the horror film festivals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have actually. Um, I, I'm not sure I can reel everyone off you know, off on top of my head yeah. to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there's like loads there's loads of uh, film festivals in America that play films so which is really, really cool and it's really nice to see that they're appreciated everywhere really and not just in Britain. So Oh well I can tell you I appreciated Seize the Night. <laughs> I really did like that. Yeah. I'm... Yeah. I think that's kind of like I mean, pe people have got their own tastes and stuff. But I think that's probably the the one that's done the best with audiences. Um, and it did get a lot of media attention as well from magazines and websites and things like that and signing conventions and things. I did tons of signing conventions off the back of that. Um, and I don't think the same kind of thing really happened with Sadie at Minus 10. I don't know whether that's the kind of film, whether it's people like vampires and action and stuff better. Um, but definitely it's been very well received by audiences. 
So, um, do you see uh, more and more uh, female filmmakers going into the horror genre? There's a lot of them been yeah. um, going to the horror genre, and they've shot some pretty cool horror. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there are tons of women out there making films. There are tons that have been making them for quite a few years. I know loads of different horror filmmakers. Um, there's horror filmmakers stateside as well. Definitely. Um, I've seen stuff come out of India, all kinds of places, really. It's definitely, yeah, there are definitely lots of women that like making horror. Um, yeah, it'd be good if we could have a little bit more of a platform for them, I think, in um, non-independent film, like studio productions and stuff. So um, do you think it, at first it was hard for female filmmakers to get into the uh, world of the horror genre film and films? Um, I don't necessarily, not, not in terms of indie stuff, because basically, if you're capable of raising a budget, like with a crowdfund or something, you can go ahead and make whatever you want. And I do think it doesn't really matter whether you're a woman or not, people will pick it up the same. If they like it, it doesn't really matter whether you're female, male, or whatever, as a, as a director. Um, yeah, so I think that's fine. The only thing I would say... Um, Sometimes there's an expectation if you're a female filmmaker that you're going to make a certain kind of story that is going to have like a certain kind of message, um, uh, or, or be a certain you know like making a action horror might not be what people typically think a female is going to make. So I do think that there's some certain discriminations there in the kind of horror film that you make. Now um, let's talk about. Um, you got nominated for your uh, column in uh, We Bury the Dead magazine, uh, Emma Dark's uh, Dark Corner. Can you tell me a little bit about yeah. your column? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we Belong Dead. So I've been writing for We Belong Dead for three years now, just over three years. And that's run by um, a friend of mine called Eric McNaughton. He's run that for about 30 years, I believe, the magazine. And it's been... Um, growing over that whole time it's like very professional now uh, it's a great magazine and my column just came about really um, talking about my films talking about what I've been up to events I've been to talking about other uh, horror filmmakers things I've watched and taking like questions as well from readers so making it a bit more interactive that's pretty cool now tell me the origin of Emma Dark how did Emma Dark become to be and got fascinated in the world of horror and sci-fi? What was your passion that d driven you into that to be a filmmaker and a writer? Okay, so in terms of like like in horror, I've always liked horror from as you know as early in age as I can remember. We're talking like a young kid. Basically, I was watching things. No, I know this isn't horror, but I was watching Star Trek and things like that from the age of two. So, you know, pretty much going towards genre stuff. Um, Albert Pugh's The Sword and the Sorcerer, which is a dark fantasy, but horror elements. I was watching that from a very, very young age. Um, just tons of things. But I've always gravitated towards horror. And in terms of the filmmaking stuff, I have done filmmaking before that, but it's been more like corporate filmmaking and stuff. So not, not super exciting with vampires and things. Um, or maybe a different kind of vampire. <laughs> But, but yeah, I basically just went to a few horror festivals and thought, well, why aren't I, you know, spending some of my free time do, doing more, really, with what I want to do? So I've, I've done modelling and photography and all kinds of things like that in my own, like, personal free time. And I thought, you know, why not actually tackle a genre film? And I did. You sure did. Um, since you like Star Trek, um, have you ever thought about doing a Star Trek fan film? No, I haven't. But to be honest, I'm sure if I did, it's one of it, those sort of fan films. If you get something that's really popular, like Star Trek, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Marvel, something like that, and you make it really good, you will get tons and tons of views online. So I do think that's a really good way of getting your work seen. I mean, you have to check IP. No one wants to be sued for making something, but I don't think that really happens very much these days. So. I think people understand fan films are fan films. No one's really going to make money out of them. So, Yeah, that's true too, but there's a lot of good ones out there. I mean, I've seen like tons of Halloween fan films, Star Trek fan films, 
Marvel fan films, Batman fan films, and I've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of great uh, vampire short films out there, too. I mean, I mean, there's a, a great taste out there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. There's that, um, and I think it was made by, by people that are in uh, Hollywood production studio somewhere. There's a Batman versus Predator fan film, like very short, if I remember rightly. I've only ever seen that quite low res, but that was really cool looking. But yeah, there's a, there is a lot of good stuff out there. Since you've been um, dabbling in a little bit of horror and all that, too, um, have you ever thought about maybe doing like a dark fantasy film? I have, actually, yeah. I have, yeah. Um, I spent like quite a lot of time writing different stories, basically, over the past couple of years. And one of those was going to be a dark fantasy film. Um, For me to actually go ahead and make something, I need to be like so um, set on that to do it and I have have um, got something I'm going to be making but it's not a dark fantasy but yeah maybe the dark fantasy will get a look in at some point if not I mean all of these all of these different stories I've written perhaps I'll put them in a book or something at some point that'd be pretty cool so when you like uh, write scripts and um, start making your own f- mm. your own films uh, what's your uh, preparation how do you prepare yourself um, when you like write that script to finally shoot into like a short film or a regular film, um, what are the, some of the stuff you um, go through to really prepare that to shoot that certain film in your eyes? Yeah, so for me it starts off like I usually have just a vignette in my head of a scene or something like that or just you know a character or something and then I start drawing that down and I usually start doing a poster, which is what I'm doing at the minute, Um, which I don't really know if that's other people's processes. I don't think it is, but I start off visually usually. Um, And then I get like a basic structure together for the script, get a first draft down, and then it will be the case of rewriting that until I get something that works. And often when you cast um, something, the tweaks will have to be made and stuff. And a lot of the times the dialogue, I want to see how people actually... um, perform with that dialogue and that might get changed as well and in terms of the actual reproduction yeah it's just a case of basically plowing into getting the crowd fund done getting the location sorted getting the insurance sorted uh rehearsals lots of different meetings with people um yeah so i do put quite a lot of um time and effort into getting everything done by the book um and then shooting hopefully is um fairly easy in that in when we get to that point so yeah now since you like writing and filmmaking and you know um you know sci-fi fantasy and in the world of horror um besides that is there a passion you like do you have that like geeky passion you enjoy when you're not filmmaking or you know uh writing films or shooting films do you have like that one passion you just like to enjoy and indulge in yeah, I've got a few things, actually. So, obviously, as someone who likes films, I watch a lot of films, like a lot of films, and a lot of TV shows and stuff. But again, all, all to my personal taste, and mainly horror with some sci-fi. I read books as well. Um, one year, I think I read, like, 40 books, 40 novels, so I was locusting through a lot of books. Um, and then other things I like to draw, I like to sketch things up, and also a bit of a weird one maybe i collect dolls like not barbers um like horror dolls like puppets and stuff like billy from saw and uh chucky and all that kind of thing and i've made some of my own um dolls as well like from from twitter chris dummies like sort of toy versions i've made a candy man and dark man and then little characters of my own creation so but again it depends how much time i've got and if i'm making a film i don't have any time so so yeah, what? Kind of so what got you to fall in love with dolls and make doll like you know like horror type of dolls? What uh, got you into really liking dolls? Dolls creep me out, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't find them creepy. I find them cute. <laughs> you know, and even if they're like you know quite sort of slashed up and stuff, I just find them cute. Um, I've got a talky Tina as well from the Twilight Zone, actually just above my head as we're talking <laughs> on the shelf. 
And um, I don't know, I think probably my love of dolls came from watching The Bride of Chucky and Child's Play. So probably Chucky was the main one. But yeah, I do really love them. I just, I don't know. I just think they're so, um, you know, innocuous, but then you can make so much out of them. Yeah, they can become a completely uh, scary killer, can't they? So. <laughs> yeah, the reason why I got freaked out of dolls, um, I've I've told this story to to you know many people. Um, the reason why I, I got freaked out on dolls is when I was younger, uh, I stayed over at my friend's house, and this mom collected the, the old dolls, you know, with the glass eyes and stuff, and she mm. had them in the guest room all over. So I had to end up sleeping in there, and just sleeping in there and having all these like dolls staring at you really got under my skin. So I had to get out of that room and sleep on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't blame you. That might be a bit creepy if you've got tons of them staring at you. But yeah, I don't mind. I, I think they're nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I can look at dolls. They don't. I mean, looking at them don't really bother me. But if I'm in like a room full of them, don't know if they're haunted or anything. It, it just really uh, gets yeah. under my skin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you doing any other uh, upcoming projects? Yeah, yeah. So, like I mentioned, I am writing my next film. Um, I've been working on a poster today, actually. So, yeah, one one time I will actually get this poster finished. It's just supposed to be a teaser, but I've gone over the top of it. So, um, but it's looking pretty nice. So, and yeah, uh, writing the, the script. Wow. So, what type of film is going to be? Um, can you tell a little bit of it, or is this hush hush? Yeah, yeah. I can't tell too much, but I'll, I'll give a little snippet. So okay. it'll be a short film again, just because, yeah, budget and stuff and time. Um, but it will be a horror. It'll be probably more full-on horror than anything I've done before. Um, I want to try and get a little bit more gore in there if I can this time. Um, and it will be like a dark uh, techno horror, and it will be demonic. So, yeah, quite a lot of things going on in it quite a lot of things i want to put in it and i'll probably have to strip some things back because otherwise it'll end up like 30 minutes or something but um yeah i'm trying to keep a run time of between 10 and 15 minutes really hey you but got yeah. my you got my attention i'm looking forward to seeing it once you pop it up that that's gonna that's gonna be cool um like i said i, I support indie horror filmmakers and also regular indie filmmakers and I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what you did next. Now, um, mm. your name, Emma Dark, you go by Emma Dark. Is there like a origin to that? How you can, um, why you go by Emma Dark? Um, well, that's my name. So that's what I, that's what I use. Um, yeah, why not? <laughs> I was just wondering, <laughs> I knew your name was Emma. I was just wondering about the dark part. If it was like a, like a story, or you know, type of like a little origin story. No. <laughs> okay. No, not really. No. Hey, <laughs> not really. Hey, I just wanted to know. This inquiry of mine wanted to one. know. <laughs> yeah, perhaps I should sort of get a sinister backstory to myself. <laughs> hey, that'd be kind of interesting <laughs> if you wrote a backstory about yourself, how Emma Dark came to be in the world of horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would read that short story. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should. Maybe I should make it. You should. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, your um film, uh, you know, sees the night. I know it's a short film. Um, do you um have you put it like on physical media or anything of some of your shorts or? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know they're out on YouTube and Vimeo and stuff like that because you need to. I think you know, with a short film, you can't bury it, you can't hide it away, or stick it behind a paywall permanently. But, yeah, I, I have, um, so in the UK, we have to BBFC rate things, otherwise we can get told off. So um, mine are rated, and they're rated at 15, both of those uh, festival films. And I have, yeah, I have basically put them on DVD, I artwork the cover and stuff, so it's all, like, fully professional, and, yeah, I wanted to do that, because partly for backers and partly for... Um, you know, why not really? Why wouldn't you if you've made something? Why wouldn't you want to put it on DVD? It's all self-distributed, but yeah. Shoot, I would love to get Season Night. I'll just put that in my uh, fiscal media library because I support fiscal media because yeah. that's important. Um, don't get me wrong. Um, I, I stream too. It just seems like more of the 
uh, casual fans are more streaming than really thinking about, you know, physical media. Because over here in the States, uh, you know, physical media is slowly disappearing unless you go to, like, boutique websites to buy the films. But everywhere else, it just seems like it's disappearing. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. There's a film on Shudder called um, The Advent Calendar, which is amazing. Really, really good film. And I thought, oh, I'll pick that up on Blu-ray or something, DVD, Blu-ray, whatever I can find. It's not out there. <laughs> you can only get it on streaming. So, And I've noticed that with a few films now. Yeah, you just can't pick up. If, if it's a new film, an independent film, sometimes you just can't pick it up on hard media, which is a real shame. It is, because there's a lot of great indie horror films out there and regular indie you know, uh, films out there I've been looking for and, you know, they will never come out on DVD or Blu-ray. I mean, there's some, but, you know, um, the ones I like, you know, I try to see if they came out or not. But, yeah, I totally agree with you because there's some great films that you'll never get the chance to see on on disc to really, you know, appreciate it more. I'm one of those uh, collect, um, collectors who like to have the physical media in my hand so I can go back and watch it over and over where it's, uncut it's not edited and you can watch it forever because like if you watch a certain film on streaming for a while th they can just take that off edit it or it can just just disappear forever mm -hmm. yeah exactly exactly and that's another thing as well with the editing of films which could happen with older films as well um also even just like star wars obviously they got edited by george lucas and it was difficult to find the original so yeah, I think it's always good to have hard media as well, definitely. I think so, too. I got the original uncut, uh, original Star Wars films on VHS, thank God, when it yeah. first came out. So I got it, so I, you know, before, you know, Lucas did the special edition, and then they brought it back out again. But, yeah, I have, you know, the original uncut, which I love on VHS, and and I know a lot of people that collect VHS, too. And, you know, there's a lot of films on VHS that really never made it to DVD and Blu-ray, which is kind of sad, too. Yeah, yeah, that is, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember um, selling a lot of my VHS and thinking, oh, I'll upgrade to DVD at the time, you know, and then didn't do it, and then now you can't get them. Well, now they're, like, super expensive, so... Oh, definitely yeah. are. I've seen some that go, like, all the way up to $200, $300 for a certain VHS tape. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I suppose they're a rarity now. Yeah, it is because there's there's a lot of collectors that um, still collect VHS. Um, I know a lot of people who have tons of VHS and they go around all around the United States or, you know, or try to pay extra money, you know, from another country to get these tapes. I mean, uh, there's a lot of diehard VHS fans that don't want to give up the VHS. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah. They, collect, they collect DVD and Blu-ray, but they rather have, you know, have it on VHS. And I also noticed, um, there's a few like independent horror films and a few, uh, you know, newer movies out that, um, you can see them being on VHS here and there too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It seems to be like a little niche market. So you get to put something on VHS now. It's a bit like um, with music, with everything going on, LPs, vinyl. Yeah, um, so do you think, since um, since physical media is dying, do you think it'll come back around again, just like how vinyl did? I think it will. I think it will. I mean, I do think, even, even with my own collection of DVDs and Blu-rays, I'm running out of space a little bit, so maybe there needs to be a bit of a smaller form back to one of the cases or something. But yeah, it would be great if... Um, yeah, I mean, it's not died out yet or anything, but it would be great if we could get some of those things that we're only seeing on streaming actually on hard media. I think so, too. And over there, uh, you know, over there in England and over in Europe, you guys get a lot of great stuff on DVD and Blu-ray that the United States yeah. doesn't get as well. So certain films, I'm kind of jealous about that. <laughs> yeah, is that like all the Arrow video stuff and everything? Yeah, I do love Arrow a lot. I collect a lot of um, Arrow videos, which is a blessing. You know, same with the. I also like cr um, collecting the Criterion Edition uh, films too. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a bit of a when when you've got two releases as well from different labels. It's like, oh, what one should I get? 
I know because they're, they're <laughs> yeah, they're pretty expensive. You're all, you're like, do I want the arrow or should I get the very pricey Criterion? And you know, it's like, hmm, they're both yeah. expensive, but which one should I get? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Yeah, it gets difficult as a collector. Yeah, it does. So where can everybody find you on social media so they know what you're doing next? Yeah. They can find me all over, really. Facebook is probably one of the main ones. I think that's Emma Dark Official. Um, So it's Instagram. Uh, Twitter is M Dark Official because there wasn't enough characters for Emma Dark Official. Um, or they can just go to my website, emmadark.com, and there's loads of links out to all kinds of things and stuff about me on there. And Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for uh, coming on and um, coming on the show tonight. It was a blast. Well, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, and really everybody, good. thank you for listening to Horror Pop After Midnight.